the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
Coming from Hawaii, we have a thing that we call ohana. Ohana is about family. And in Hawaii, we define family as everyone in your universe. And that's where City National Bank comes in. They truly understand our business. They take an interest to know where we're headed, and they understand the food industry. But they also understand our ohana, and no other bank does that. Good evening, and welcome to the Los Angeles Times Food Bowl Forum. Food Waste, Accessibility, and the Relationship to Agriculture, presented by City National Bank. I'm your host, Clint Schaff, with the Los Angeles Times. Tonight's conversation is part of our annual LA Times Food Bowl series in support of the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank. LA Regional Food Bank collects food from charitable organizations and other groups and distributes to people in need every day. With the help of 30,000 volunteers, LA Food Bank serves nearly a million people per month. Here's more on their important work. The Los Angeles Regional Food Bank's mission is to mobilize every resource to fight hunger throughout our community. Even before the pandemic, the problem in Los Angeles County was urgent with more than two million people not having enough food to feed themselves or their families. Since the outbreak, the need for food assistance has nearly doubled. We're now seeing people who have never needed help before depending on the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank. Every week, we're providing nutritious food through emergency food distributions so that people throughout our community can prepare well-balanced meals. These drive-through distributions provide large quantities of food to thousands of individuals and families who have been laid off or reduced to part-time work only. At each distribution event, we're helping 1,000 to 7,500 households. Because the food bank collects millions of pounds of food that's been generously donated, and because tens of thousands of volunteers have stepped up, every dollar that is donated is enough to provide enough food for four meals. With your caring support, we're not going to rest until the number of people in Los Angeles County who go hungry is zero. Thank you, LA Food Bank. For more information and to donate, please visit lafoodbank.org. Now I'd like to introduce you to my LA Times colleague, garden and lifestyle writer, Jeanette Morantos, who will moderate a conversation with our special guests. Please welcome Jeanette. Thank you, Clint. It's great to meet you, at least digitally. Yes, nice to meet you. Well, okay, so let's begin. All right. I'm Jeanette Morantos. I write about gardening, plants, and other lifestyle topics for the LA Times, and I'm a committed, if imperfect, composter which means I save all of my plant-based food scraps in a bucket next to my kitchen sink. I'm always amazed at how quickly that bucket gets filled up with banana peels, strawberry tops, sweet potato peels, tomato stems, and embarrassing to say, forgotten bits of produce that turn to slime in the back of my refrigerator. I know I'm not alone in my shame, but food waste is a much larger and more complicated issue than a shriveled bag of carrots. That's why we brought in four panelists from diverse food-related backgrounds to give us a bigger picture about the issues around food waste, why we should care, and what we as individuals can do to make things better. Our panelists tonight are Karen Ross, Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, who grew up in a family that's still farming in Nebraska. Michael Flood, President and CEO of the Los Angeles Regional Food Bank, which collects and distributes food to some 700 agencies, shelters, and food pantries around LA County. Jemiah Hargens, founder of Crop Swap LA, a company designed to grow food on unused urban spaces to create what he calls hyper-local green jobs and nutrient-dense food, such as the lush Asante micro farm in the front yard of a View Park home. And Mary Sue Milliken, chef and, order, or, <laughs> chef and owner of Border Grill restaurants in Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and the new Socolo restaurant in Santa Monica. 
welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time to be with Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. So Karen, I'd like to start with you. You've defined food waste as food that cannot be repurposed. Why is that a problem? Do the rotten carrots in my fridge really affect someone who's hungry in Long Beach? Um, yes, they do. First of all, there's a lot of food that is not used, but still has nutritional value. So it's important that we recover that food and make sure it goes to people who are hungry. And especially after the pandemic year, and we saw the film from the LA regional food banks, it's so important that we not let anything that could go to people for their nutritional value, that we capture that and repurpose that. So that's number one. Number two, food waste is a huge contributor to climate change. When we waste food by not repurposing it, and it goes into the dumpster as opposed to the composter, and I'll get to that for <clears throat> that, but when it goes into a landfill, that generates methane gas emissions, and methane is a short-lived climate pollutant that is so harmful contributing to climate change. Landfills generate, they're the third largest generator of methane emissions. So it is a big problem. And three, when we waste food, we've wasted natural resources. The land, the water, the labor, the inputs that it took to grow that food. So we're out of balance. And that's why I'm so passionate about avoiding food waste, preventing food waste, capturing food that still has nutritional value to give it to people in need and to minimize the waste of our natural resources and reduce methane emissions by not allowing it to go into landfills. Mary Sue, restaurants often get blamed for wasting food. Is that a fair rap? How do you see the problem? Well, first, I think we need to understand, you know, the history from a sort of sociological point of view. Our food system has been transitioning, and especially the transitions have been quicker and quicker in the last couple hundred years. And that's led to a lot of average citizens caring less and less about food scarcity because it's not a big threat anymore. We have, you know, an amazing large-scale canning and preserving food, you know, industry in our country and every refrigerator has a home and there's a pretty steady yet not quick enough decrease in people living under the poverty line there's still way too many but all these things kind of have led to this celebration of abundance and expectations so i think one big thing is that's a problem is huge portion sizes so look at you know the huge enormous success of cheesecake factory and when I try to make my portion size smaller in my restaurant, I get a lot of pushback from my team who are, you know, who are really right on the front lines talking to customers and they know what the expectation is. I had this great idea to serve two tacos instead of three on the lunch plate and then offer every customer a free taco if they wanted yet another one, you know, but my team just couldn't handle it. So I think there's an expectation there. And, you know, Chefs are very passionate about not wasting food because it taps into our creativity and it bolsters the bottom line, theoretically. So if we buy food that doesn't get used, we go out of business. So, you know, the, on the flip side of that, when we try to use every single part of an animal from nose to tail or every part of a plant from the roots to the stems, to the leaves, to the flowers, the seeds, that all takes an incredible amount of labor and labor is the most expensive thing on your plate. So there is a price resistance of, of consumers to spend what the true cost of food is. And so in there's times when rescuing food out of the waste stream takes more labor than grinding it into say pet food or just letting it rot in the landfill, which creates those horrible greenhouse gases that Karen mentioned. So um, I think, you know, those are a couple ways that restaurants kind of interact with this food waste. Do you think part of the problem is that we equate quantity? We, we pay X amount of money for a, a restaurant dinner. And do we we look at the money as, as buying quantity versus quality? I do think there's that. I think it's just been a long history of over hundreds of years of, of creating this expectation that 
we can we have an abundance of food. It's it's cheap, which it shouldn't be if the farm bill were managed properly at the federal level. Um, so it you know we're we're definitely you know bucking against um, a very long kind of entrenched system that we have to work at changing. Jemaya, you grow food at Asante Micro Farm, a front yard farm that produces enough vegetables to fill 50 subscription food boxes every week. Can you briefly explain, just to start out, what a micro farm is and why you're focusing your work in areas known as food deserts? Absolutely. So you're right. We uh, have constructed a water recycling front yard micro farm, which has on-site composting, harvesting, washing, bagging, and on uh, uh, and uh, sidewalk pickups for our, our members here in the View Park area. And the idea of a micro farm is very simple. It's that it has everything it needs to produce food. And you know, in our area, we are accustomed to a term called food deserts. But food deserts is a very polite way to say that there are capitalist and grocery store influenced decision making on the food that ends up on our table, what's there and what's not. Um, it says that it's a natural occurring thing, but in truth, what we call it now in our team is food apartheid in the sense that there are decisions outside of our hands. Uh, so what a micro farm does is create a hyper local opportunity for neighbors who see the food growing on a front yard uh, to not only use their yards as an income opportunity for the family if they work with us, but also to uh, provide for their neighbors and create an opportunity where uh, you can heroically create an op uh, a solution to a problem that's deeply entrenched and out of our hands. I believe you know the grocery store system is important in some situations, you know, post-war or uh, opportunity uh, places like that. But in truth, on the daily movement, uh, we think about our food is being harvested more recently. Uh, I don't know if you know, but if the moment you harvest some food, such as things growing behind me in my backyard, the moment it's harvested, it begins to deplete its nutrient value. In over 24 hours, it may go down as far as 70%. So it's very important to eat the food as soon as it's harvested, and that's what a micro farm does. Well, first of all, th this is a really serious topic, but those birds in the background, I feel like I'm in a I Disney know, like film talking about. <laughs> It's really wonderful. You've obviously <laughs> created a beautiful environment anyway. Um, but you. let's get back to the topic. <laughs> so, <laughs> do, you, do you see a lot of wasted food on a micro farm? So it's important to harvest on site uh, and also to compost on site. I think as, as the chef mentioned a moment ago, composting is an essential asset um, and process in all farming operations. Uh, not only because there's natural waste from pieces of the plant that we don't use, we need to toss it somewhere, uh, but also it's a revenue generator and a very important regenerative aspect for the con continuity of that micro farm or that farm. Uh, we, in the future, plan to sell that compost to our members, those who, who've signed up or those who are in the neighborhood. Uh, we do also compost here at our house. I agree that bin fills up in the kitchen way quicker than you imagine. And for those at home that are looking at a way to do that, just dig a hole, add some water, and keep it turned. Add some red worms, and that's that's composting. Really, it's very simple. Um, but we we expect that you know that'll be more important over time. A big aspect of what we're doing is environmental. Uh, that is uh, both capturing rainwater, recycling the water we use. Uh, recycling the soils we use and using nutrient dense ingredients to create food that is higher quality than you might be able to find on the shelves. Uh, we are also doing water testing and bricks testing, which tells you the nutrient density of the food and allows you to kind of compare it to what you're used to. So I think that uh, it's cool. important to, to do that composting on site, uh, uh, wherever you're farming. So that's, so that's one thing you can do with all any food you might have for, or leaves or whatever that you're not going to be selling or, mm -hmm. or using for well we're going to get back to this subject but um michael let's go to you for just a minute and sum this up here you're in the business of repurposing food to feed hungry people and during the pandemic the demand for your food more than doubled so in this case wasn't food waste a good thing i mean i don't, I don't mean to be flip i'm just wondering if there's an upside to food waste 
Well, there's an opportunity that food waste presents itself. And, and food banks got going many years ago, our food bank back in 1973, uh, because of surplus nutritious wholesome food um, that could get captured and distributed to people and families who need it. So, you know, we are a prolific uh, grower and producer of food in the United States and especially in the state of California. And overall, that's a good thing. Uh, it, you know, it's a very positive thing to, to be able to um, grow and produce uh, as much food as we do. But the flip side of that is there's a lot of food that, that's left over. There's a lot of food that does not get eaten, consumed by, um, you know, the end user. And so food banks, to give you an idea, um, food waste is about 100 or surplus food, however you define it. It's about 100 billion pounds nationwide. Food banks tap into 4 billion pounds of that. Our food bank last year tapped into uh, 160 million pounds of food um, uh, from all those different sources. And, and we've designed programs. We've worked with Secretary Ross on a, um, a farm to family program through the years. We've worked with Mary Sue on what could be done with restaurants. Um, we've set up an extra helpings program um, and, and many ways to, again, try to capture the food that um, is still wholesome and really nutritious. We're really not interested in food that, that is not nutritious. That's not what families and individuals are asking for and can get acquired um, and get to people who need it. Um, so that really is the, the focus area. I know we'll touch on it later, but you know, one opportunity for all of us is the biggest piece of the pie of food waste is household waste. It's about half of the food that's thrown away in the United States is from all of us, from all of us buying food, thinking we're gonna eat it. And unfortunately, you know what? Best intentions, just like your, I, I can't remember, was that a tomato? A shriveled Jeanette? bag of carrots. Oh, <laughs> carrots, yeah, sorry, I couldn't remember. So no, that that is a huge issue in the United States. And as Mary Sue mentioned, food is relatively inexpensive in our country because we're a huge grower of food. Um, but, you know, we kind of have an appetite a bit beyond what is really kind of good for the food system. And that does lead to a lot of waste. I know a lot of people are composting now locally. Um, some cities are allowing food scraps to go into um, green bins and the like. And we need more of that because, again, as, as Secretary Ross mentioned, um, the environmental, negative environmental impact of food going to landfill uh, is a huge problem for us. Well, we're going to talk about composting, but I, Michael, could you just repeat that? I, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around that statistic. Did you say that there was 100 billion pounds of food that was, what was that figure yeah, earlier? 100 that billion, was, 108 that was, billion. Yeah, research is showing there's different USDA and other research organizations indicate that we're talking about 100 billion pounds. Not all of that is wholesome food that really is gonna get captured or could get captured and consumed. Um, and again, there's sort of this pyramid of, you know, the first place you wanna go is to try to um, capture that food so that it ends up feeding people. Um, but there's other steps. We're we talk about composting, there's biofuels, uh, there's other reuses that are going on at scale um, in throughout California, here locally and throughout the U.S. that does divert food waste yeah. from landfill, which really is the ultimate kind of goal uh, because of, again, climate change, environmental issues and the like. So that 100 billion is not, or 108 billion is not going into landfills. That's just in general food that is, that, that is uh, right. being, uh, that's, not that's, used for its original purpose. Right, that's the piece of the pie. Food banks get about four billion of that and distribute it, which is that grows every year as we set up more programs to capture that food. Um, again, half of that piece of the pie is household waste, um, and then there's other pieces. So of the you're pie saying that involved. you're saying that fifty billion pounds of food is yep. That's a lot of slime in the back of our refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just that I'm. Um, no, I'm really embarrassed. Okay, well, <clears throat> that's that's sobering. <clears throat> so let's let's talk about composting. Mary Sue, 
when we talked earlier, you said one solution, uh, one solution to food waste is lobbying our elected officials to make composting a part of our daily lives. Can you elaborate on that? What do you think that would look like? Well, thank I, you. Well, I'm going to actually... just preface that by saying, well, we, you know, because uh, was it Jemima was saying it's just easy. You just dig a hole in your backyard and fill it with your refrigerator slime and some red regular worms. But a lot of us don't have backyards. So we have apartments or we have condos and then we don't have any space for that at all. So how does composting work for, for all of us? Well, in general, I believe that waste management is imperative. You know, I would love to see LA County and eventually the state of California lead um, the way with incentives to households and to businesses that decrease the, the waste and you know, encourages all of us to be more really diligent about recycling. I, I've looked into some programs in Germany that I feel are really like state of the art and um, they've really had a great track record of, of reducing um, waste, all kinds of waste. Because you know, there's also food packaging, which is worrying right. during the pandemic, we, we grew our food packaging yeah. um, budget to astronomical proportions and it breaks my heart. Um, but to get back to composting, I think, um, I wish it was as easy as digging a hole for me because I'm never having that much <laughs> luck. Um, but my restaurant food, of course, has meat and cheese and oils and all kinds of things in it because we're basically taking it off the plates, whatever people isn't, aren't right. eating. And then there's a little bit on the front end of, you know, carrot tops or, um, you know, just pieces of vegetables that can't be used. But, um, you know, I have restaurants in Vegas and LA and Santa Monica and certain um, municipalities are better than others at helping businesses compost. Like I'm in a building downtown that's kind of old and they don't have room for a compost bin. So I'm just stuck. I, I really just don't have a choice. I'm in a high rise and, um, you know, I think some buildings don't have room for yet another full size bin. I think we have to get creative about having a bunch of small bins that hold the same amount of waste. Cause in theory, you only have, you have enough room for all your waste, but if we were able to really split it up so that it could be dealt with in a much more um, proactive way, I think it would be great. And I, I also think, you know, in, in home at home, when you're, you have those banana peels and everything, but you also sometimes have a little bit of food, leftover food waste. Um, but th the main thing is to uh, get all those, you know, pieces and figure out how to get it into a bio waste program that is harvesting the energy we can get out of it after it has already been proven not to be fit for consumption. So we couldn't pass it on to anybody, you know, after it, you know, at the last, gasp is when we have to make sure it does not get into the landfill. Well, so Karen, let's talk yeah. about Senate Bill 1383, which was introduced yep. by State Senator Ricardo Lara and approved by the Assembly in 2016. It sets specific targets for reducing emissions of SLCP, short-lived climate pollutants such as methane gas. Uh -huh. Specifically, the law says that by January 1st, 2025, we must reduce statewide disposal of organic waste by 75% from 2014 levels. We were also supposed to reduce the disposal of organic waste by 50% uh, by January 1st, 2020, and we got kind of distracted in 2020. So I'm wondering, how do we stand on those targets and also, most communities have some kind of pickup for lawn clippings and other green waste. So why aren't we seeing more composting programs? Well, it's complicated. It's government, it's complicated. <laughs> but um, the first step is to have the goals established. Um, and then it's bringing all the stakeholders together because not everything is going to go to composting. Some of it is going to go through a very long-standing way of recycling food waste, which is rendering, which can then turn it into other kinds of products. It can turn it into, there are new products now for um, organic liquid fertilizer um, as, a, as a replacement for synthetic fertilizer. And Michael mentioned it earlier for biofuels. So actually there's quite a bit of competition for that. We are working very hard with our colleagues at CalRecycle to really expand 
high quality composting that is done to high standards so that it doesn't exacerbate food safety issues. Um, compost for commercial use and on large scale use, if it's not done correctly, can present some food safety issues. So that's one of the challenges there. We also have to work with many startups and there are new business models that have been created to really capture this. And they'll do the sorting and turn it into high quality compost for sale to farmers and to get it into a large scale use. Our challenge is oftentimes this waste is generated in a very high populated area, but we need to get it mm -hmm. out to the countryside and to the farms. And then we're adding truck miles to get it there, which is exacerbating. So we have to think about ourselves in the very circular economy of how do we take the waste and the nutrient value of this for going back into the soils? How do we efficiently move that to where the demand is? And the demand is growing. And in fact, we've been look, working for the last year and a half with our colleagues at the Water Board and the Air Board to make sure we can do more on-farm composting for your own use on the farm, not for commercial sale, and be able to do it without creating um, unintended consequences with air quality issues or some sort of leaching into groundwater. So composting is highly regulated for all the right reasons, but some of it is just moving it from where it's being generated to getting it efficiently to where we could use it on even more farms. And then trying to match where are the compost sites to where the real demand is. So we're, we're working on it, but unfortunately we are falling behind on some of our timelines to make it happen. Sorry for the long answer. So, uh, it's the reality. No, no, but <laughs> I'm a, it, it sounds like we, like I say, we were distracted in 2020, but it sounds like we haven't met that 50% target date yet. Is that right? Are, are, are we on track, you think, to hit yes. the 75%? 75% is going to take huge investment, which the governor's budget for May Revise does propose some additional significant investment to help us reach these goals. We also want to accelerate our efforts on circular economy, which means we need more recycling. And recycling the bottle bill, as it's long been known, has also fallen behind because the economics aren't working. So we really need to focus on circular economy and just reducing waste but especially this organic waste stream because of the methane emissions that, that are created in our landfills. What do you mean by circular economy? Can you just can you just Well, circular economy is that, that like, like let's try to take waste out of our vocabulary and think about everything we do and process as a byproduct that could be repurposed or turned into another useful ah. product. And so thinking about it in a, in a circle. Um, you know, plastics are gonna be one of the hardest ones and certainly all the plastic that was generated because of how we had to distribute food last year is a challenge. Mm -hmm. But there's so many new and exciting technologies that can be part of this. And so I just think it's, it's about this transition to our green economy and really capitalizing on technology and innovation, which California is known for. And I think we can create new business models around really thinking about our waste streams differently and thinking about how do we capture alternative value streams from that and repurposing it. Okay. Well, I'm a dreamer. <laughs> I, I, no, you know, I feel like we could talk about that all night long, but um, so let, let's move on to something else that I wonder what kind of an impact this has on our food waste, which is sell by use by dates. This is a mystery to me. Um, Mary Sue, uh, I have a friend who constantly berates me for paying attention to those little use by dates stamped on my food. Uh, she insists they're meaningless. I know food, you know, I, I don't really agree with her. I've bought some stuff that, that um, accidentally where I didn't notice the food date and it was not good. Uh, so I, I think there may be some value in having that. But I, I know food safety is a huge issue in the restaurant world. What do you think about sell by, use by dates? Are they reliable? Is there some way we can make, do they contribute to this problem? Well, I'm so glad you asked the question because yes, they undoubtedly really contribute to the problem in a huge way. I hate them. Um, I believe they serve pretty much one purpose and that's to get people to throw food away. Um, and people are really easily frightened about their food supplies, and rightly so, but there's been a 
a lot of big organizations who've uh, you know, successfully lobbied for these sell-by dates and done a good job of scaring people into throwing food away. Perfectly good food. But um, but they're um, different, aren't they? There's sell-by and there's use-by, right? So sell-by is what the stores got to pull the stuff off by. Is that correct? And then the use-by is for me, I look at it and say, oh my gosh, I got to I gotta throw it away because it's a week after the, the use-by date. Right, but being a food professional who's cooked for 45 years, I know that both of those dates are complete hogwash. And, you know, <laughs> we are, are we have an innate animalistic superpower called, you know, smell, sight, feel. We can look at food and figure out whether it's going to hurt us or not. All of us are born with that. It's like a miracle. We don't need <laughs> a Kellogg's to tell us when to throw the cereal away. We really don't. And so, you know, I tell people, use your common sense. And also, I think back to sort of the compost question, before things are ready to go in the compost, you know, get creative and think about how you can take those carrots that we're gonna be spoiling in like three days and pickle them or, you know, cook them and freeze them. Or, you know, sometimes I have a huge tomato crop in my backyard and I don't have any time. So I just pick them, wash them and throw them in the freezer, just like that. Freezers are friends, dehydrators, pickling and fermenting foods is a really good way to avoid uh, waste. You know, when you have those bananas or those strawberries that you just didn't get to, I put them in the freezer, I IQF them, individually quick frozen on a cookie sheet, and I throw them in a plastic bag. IQF, and then, okay. <laughs> when somebody wants a smoothie, I just pop them in the Thank freezer. Thank you for defining that. <laughs> There's a lot of tricks oh, that, up my sleeve. We're not wasting one drop of food. This is really, this is really important. I want to get to this cooking question, but I want to ask uh, Karen and then Michael too. I, I just want you to weigh in on this, uh, Karen. From a government perspective, are these sell-by dates keeping us safe, or are they just a way to fool people? Uh, well, who decides these sell-by dates? Yeah. We're only talking about a couple. There's actually probably a dozen terms that are used to enjoy by. I mean, it, it goes on and on. Part of it is because a company or a brand wants the highest quality possible, and so that's how they got them started, whatever it might be. So during the Obama administration, there was a real concerted effort by FDA, EPA, and USDA on food waste and trying to bring the national industry together to come to some sort of agreement on what it would be. Because interestingly enough, while food safety is regulated, um, these use of these terms is is not, and they were trying to facilitate getting agreement of what would be the right terminology. And I think some of the momentum of industry, you know, working themselves through this, I think we lost some of that momentum because the pressure's not there. And I think we just need to recreate that momentum, and either they all come to an agreement, or government will, because there's so many reasons. In a, in a time where we shouldn't waste one resource, that we're wasting resources to grow food, to go into landfills or other ways. So sorry, I, I really think that this is the time to either bring industry together and come to agreement and be aware that it might cause some unintended consequences to food banks. It shouldn't, but we've created a, a stream of products that are being captured and going to food banks, Michael, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And I bet Jamal, because you, you're you selling fresh all the time. This isn't even an issue for you. <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. But I just want to make sure I understand this. So, so there is no common, there is no sell-by czar out there who says that, you know, nope. turnips need to be sold. by. I mean, this is all just sort of nope. randomly decided nope. by the people in the industry? Nope. Oh, yeah. okay. My friend is going to be, I'm just, I'm going to be in so much trouble with her okay well michael tell me how i mean you you must get a lot of donations from people um who all know you want their expired date pancake mixes and um do you do you have problems yeah, that's with, not uh, that's not what we're looking by? it's not yeah it's not what we're looking for um, actually um we appreciate the thought but um you know a lot of what we handle now is fresh um we certainly still see um some packaged food canned food come in and I would agree that um, the current 
code date, expiration date, best used by date is incredibly confusing. And I would say, I would agree with Secretary Ross, this is a time to get back on to that, um, that trend of trying to figure this out. Because if we're gonna set goals in California to, to reduce um, waste, then we need to have every uh, avenue available to us to, to reduce that, that type of waste. So I, I think that's really important. Um, and I, I'm not worried about it from a food bank uh, perspective. As I mentioned earlier, you know, food banks nationwide are capturing about 4 billion of the 100 plus billion pounds available. So there's still plenty of room for food banks to capture wholesome food. Uh, a lot of our growth, again, is in fresh, is in perishable, is in frozen. That's where the growth categories are, uh, which makes sense. And I think the other thing I do want to mention to that issue and, and what Jemiah is doing is there's a big move to focus more on local food um, in mm -hmm. L.A. and in other areas. And, you know, we kind of lost that here in L.A. A lot of people don't realize we were the number one agricultural county in the United yeah. States until the 40s, roughly 50s. And then, of course, we had a huge population boom. So I think local food is part of the solution. Uh, in terms of both feeding people, food access, the environmental aspect of it. There's a lot of land available and it doesn't really take much. I mean, he's the expert, he can tell you, doesn't take a lot to really um, make a difference, right? Right, Michael. In fact, I think if we grew our own food in a more efficient way, hyper-locally, we would have a lot less food waste as well. Uh, a lot of us are aware that our government subsidizes farm production in a way that creates overtilling and therefore hyper depletion of that farmland. When the farmland becomes depleted, the food that's produced from it is less desirable to those of us out here. So uh, really, I would love to see you know, some subsidies pushed the other direction toward maybe creating an urban gardening endowment, uh, something large enough that we could uh, survive and grow our urban gardening initiatives uh, off of just the interest uh, in the same way that we prioritize endowments in other situations. Uh, I think it's an important aspect and that when we grow the food this, this way, it's tasty, it's delicious. Uh, just behind me are amazing corn and tomatoes and all kinds of amazing things that my daughter, my family and I pop out and enjoy for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, and really, you know, it's about having something that's growing naturally available. It is possible for folks who are in smaller living quarters as well, uh, whether you're growing on a wall or a balcony or something mm -hmm. like an apartment building where we grow on the roof, rooftop and hire someone inside the building in order to, to keep it running. Uh, it's all possible. And that waste is immediately placed right back into the cycle, uh, whether composting becomes something that's compulsory, meaning like San Francisco, it's required, just like required uh, recycling is, and you're taxed if you don't do it. Um, or whether or not you know folks folks who can't do it themselves uh, offsource it to organizations like LA Compost or uh, uh, their their composting hubs around LA. There are ways to make it happen. Uh, we just have to reprioritize our finances and find opportunities where it's already working. That's, I'm glad you brought up LA Compost and Jemai. I'm going to stay with you for a minute because when we talked before the show, you you mentioned that half the people who get your subscription food boxes say they're getting too much produce. So how, which I, I know you're not just giving them armloads of food. So how do you decide the right amount for your boxes? And what is the real issue, do you think? Do we need more recipes? I mean, what's going on with that? You know, it's partly culture and practice. Uh, we're not used to having so much salad available. My members, we've done surveys of our 50 members. Half of them say they're getting too much. Half of them say they're getting too little. Um, I think part of it is uh, adaptation. Get those people to... together. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's what happens. You know, the, the nature of Crop Swap LA is the idea that you share with your neighbors. A lot of folks have done that uh, with the extras that they have. Um, but that also provokes us to open a composting com composting element to our business to allow our members to compost the extras. We take it extra. We give them back, you know, fresh compost and encourage them to grow in their own garden. But, you know, most mostly it's about culture, right? We are used to thinking about a snack as something that comes in a crunchy, flashy, loud plastic bag, 
when in reality, a snack could just be something like one leaf from a piece of lettuce. You don't need a whole salad with an arrangement and salad dressing and a bowl and a fork and all that situation. You might just need one piece of lettuce from your fridge and you walk on and that's your snack. Uh, so, you know, part of it is is practice. Uh, the other part of it is availability. The largest part, in fact, is that we're not accustomed to having this much fresh, green, crunchy things nearby. Um, we're used to it being a commodity, that it's something we pay a premium for and drive halfway across town to get. But in reality, it's something that could literally come from your neighbor down the street. Uh, and when that, when that transition occurs, our entire diet, our practice, our, our lifestyle, and our traditions begin to transform as well. Uh, we can see that you know, cooking is actually a meditative process, and it's one thing that brings the family together, not only the cooking, the eating, the enjoyment, the discussion around the food, uh, but also what we want to bring to our own lives. So I, I encourage folks to think about the volume of, of green and veggies that we are accustomed to and ask ourselves if what our customs are what we really deserve. Well. We're, I want to talk about cooking because this is a pet peeve of mine. But before we do, there's an important question here, Michael, I want to ask you, and that's about um, distribution supply chain. Last year, I wrote an article about farmers in central Washington who had one billion pounds of potatoes they couldn't sell or even give away during the pandemic because of distribution and transportation issues. Those problems came into sharp focus during the pandemic when many restaurants closed and stopped buying the produce farmers had already grown and needed to move because they had a new crop coming in. In the meantime, you were seeing twice the demand for food uh, from suddenly impoverished people who were put out of work by COVID-19. So during this year, I mean, we've, we've got agriculture, this whole topic about specialized agriculture is again, a, a whole evening's worth discussion, but what have we learned about our supply and distribution change in this past year, and, and how does all that affect food waste? Well, I, I was on a, a call recently with many others throughout the U.S. with USA Secretary Vilsack, and his view of it, he was he's back into office. He held that role during the Obama administration, and so he, uh, last year, he was not in that role. He was back into that role in January, and his assessment is that um, it, it's close to broken, that the supply chain, the food supply chain, the stress test that the pandemic um, put on our food supply chain showed, we have huge problems, huge problems in being able to uh, really pivot quickly. Um, part of what uh, we saw is that with restaurants uh, closing, reducing service, schools closing, conventions and the like, it led to this huge surplus of produce, of dairy, of meat items, and that had to go somewhere. To the credit of the USA last year, they did stand up a program very quickly, uh, a sort of a, a, a farmers to families food box program that did lead to a tremendous amount of that food reaching food banks so that we could get it to people who needed it. And, and really, I guess the reason I'm bringing that up is because there's certain instances that happen that the market and market forces aren't gonna be able to deal with. That it does take USDA or state of California in some instances, or you know, someone to step in uh, in order to, uh, to, to make some type of difference and to change the results that are going on. So our distribution, um, you know, it's a little bit your earlier question, isn't sort of food surplus, food waste, the, you know, the, opportunity or isn't there an upside of that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's true. I mean, our distribution um, was up 145% last year, go, uh, going from right away in March when the pandemic hit all the way through uh, the fall. And still to this day, we're running 125% higher than the pre-pandemic period. So um, so we, we see it, we see the demand for food assistance is very high. Uh, there is food there that we're able to capture. I know we haven't talked a lot about food insecurity, but you know it's a huge problem here locally. Going into the pandemic, yeah. one in five people um, were struggling mm -hmm. with food insecurity. In other words, meeting their basic needs on an ongoing basis. And of course, that got worse with the pandemic. Uh, we have a very high cost of living that does contribute to a food security rate higher here throughout Los Angeles area than in other areas. And uh, it's a it's a big, big problem and a big issue. So, you know, I would say on both the food surplus and food kind of waste issue, 
and on the food insecurity and hunger issue, we continue to have our work cut, cut out for us in a significant way. Well, when you're talking about uh, food banks, I'm wondering, I'm sure people wonder, we, we, we want to we put as much of this food into people's mouths versus landfills. What, what can people do to help food banks? Should we be writing you a check? Should we, you, you already told me you're not real excited about my pancake mixes. Um, <laughs> should I be helping you unload boxes? I mean, what's, uh, what, what, what are things that I can really be doing? Um, we have a new guest. I know. I'm just, <laughs> there's, no, there's no avoiding it. <laughs> no, very, oh, darling, darling. Um, yes, volunteering, absolutely. We're a nonprofit, so certainly funding helps. Again, we're really leveraging the dollar because we're handling primarily donated food and getting other donated services. So for every dollar, we're able to get the equivalent of four meals out to the community. So there's great leveraging in that regard. Um, I think, you know, for those that are listening uh, to this evening's conversation, you know, policy is a big part of it. And, you know, our, our elected leaders do listen, you know, to people who elect them and, you know, sort of demanding change for some of the things that we're discussing tonight, I think is very important and, and also can lead to change. So, you know, people can do, uh, also help, you know, we have a network of 700 organizations, food pantries, and other organizations that we provide uh, food to, they can use that support also. They do great, heroic work in their local neighborhood. So, you know, this is an issue that everyone can do something about to help. So the volunteering is you've just got things like boxes that need to be moved from trucks or packed with food or whatever. That's, I mean, dollars help, but being able to get people to help you do that, I think, would be useful as well. And um, I, can I just can I go ahead, Karen? Please. I just I just wanted to don't add don't. that writing a check to food banks is a really important thing to do because there's food that's donated, but there's also food that's in the marketplace because of Mother Nature is not the most predictable person sometimes on yields. And so I have friends who are produce brokers who didn't know anything about food banks, and they were able to keep their entire staff employed by participating in the USDA program last year. They have created a nonprofit to continue to source at very good prices because they know the marketplace so well to be able to supply food banks. And they think of food banks as a third channel of distribution to prevent waste and to help meet the food security needs of people. And when we think about what we offer in food banks, if we want to set lifelong habits of healthy eating, this fresh produce, this, you know, this variety of proteins become very important to meeting nutritional needs and setting lifelong healthy choices of how we eat to avoid chronic diseases. I just think it's a hugely important topic, and I want people to know that there's many things they can do to help with their contributions as well. Sorry, Michael, I just had to put that in. No, no, but I'm going to, I, I oh, keep going on that subject as well, too. Um, <laughs> I, I, it just one thing, and you won't tell me if I'm wrong about this. It seems to me that part of the problem with food turning to slime in our refrigerators is that we buy this beautiful produce and then we don't know how to cook it. And I say we, um, I, I, I wonder how important, and maybe this is, just me being on a soapbox, but how important is it? How much of a difference do you think it would make if people knew how to cook? Mary Sue, I'll start with you. Uh, I mean, you're in the restaurant business. Obviously, you benefit from people not cooking, but <laughs> but I've, I've also <laughs> I've also written five cookbooks and I've taught cooking on television <laughs> and I love inspiring people to cook. So I would say that it is huge. Um, having the ability to handle food from the time you purchase it and how you store it to how you use it or preserve it if you if it can't be used because you're too busy. That is all like paramount that we teach people how to do that. And, um, you know, I think during the pandemic, actually, I, I, one silver lining was a lot of people had time and then they had time to figure out how to cook because they didn't really know thing one about you know, how to feed themselves in some ways. 
Um, but I think what we have to really also consider is time because time is money. And I think the people that Michael serves, many, I'm embarrassed to say many of my employees work two jobs. They uh, don't have time and they do care about quality and they do care about food and they know the difference. But time is what it takes to process food, to grow it in your backyard, to you know harvest it and store it and and especially vegetables which is of course the thing that we want them to eat more of because it creates a healthier body and it creates a healthier planet then yeah. you know you can get your sort of nutritional uh high from proteins really fast and easy but to get it from vegetables takes more time so i do feel that there's a there's um the bottom line is, you know, labor is costly and workers, you know, in the food industry from the farm all the way to the fork are not paid what they deserve and they don't have benefits that they deserve. And, you know, I think in order to service people who care about quality in their food, we have to figure out a way to, you know, make it as good to not buy the commodity meat and cheeses that are are processed and you know a lot of food waste happens at those plants and a lot of that food gets put into the pet food chain because it's just too costly to pay for labor to actually break down the animals and use all those different bits you know so that yeah. should cost that needs to cost the same as buying from a family farm that's you know local in LA county well, Michael, and we're gonna we're gonna be wrapping up here in just a minute because we just have a couple minutes left. But Michael, I just want to ask you: I mean, for hungry people, how big an issue is it that they don't have the food or the equipment? I mean, they don't have the 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 time, or maybe they don't have the skill to cook. Is is that an issue? Is is just being able to cook, or 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 knowing how to cook the food that you give them, the 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 a bag of rice or a bag of beans or whatever. I, I think the surveys we do is it's more on the vegetables as Mary Sue is, is uh, mm -hmm. kind of highlighting. I mean, a piece of fruit, um, people know generally what to do with a piece of fruit. Um, that's more straightforward. Um, you know, we do have, unfortunately, a very high unhoused population in Los Angeles. So yeah. um, again, another uh, part of this that makes it more complicated perhaps than, than in other areas. But, you know, it, it is an issue I think the the overall overarching issue too of nutrition education, and you know, in terms of you know, uh, just things that are not nutritious and and really can do you harm from a food standpoint, uh, those things are marketed very very heavily, and uh, so it, it's both cooking and the and also the the other issue related to uh, nutrition education and the like, and um, that that is definitely an important aspect of this. You raise a good point, Mary Sue, too, that a lot of people just uh, just finding the time to actually do this. It'd be lovely if we all had, you know, well, if things were different <laughs> in that regard. Um, so I, I hear, you know, we need we need more um, we need more resources for people, more time, more interest in composting, louder voices to our legislators. I, I just uh, quickly, for all of you, I'm going to ask each of you to just tell me um, what you hope people will take away from this session regarding food waste or just what do you think is the most important thing. And, and we need to keep our answers fairly concise here. But uh, Jamiah, let's start with you. I think the most important message for food waste is to grow food you don't want to waste. <laughs> grow food you don't want to waste and that you can share because um, I don't know if you know or not, but food that's in a can from 70 years ago will likely have a higher nutrient density than food in the can that you just bought today. And that's because back then it was grown in nutrient dense fields and had uh, better inputs. And so we just have to make a concerted effort to create what we want um, and then make a financial commitment uh, both as a society, as institutions, as individuals, as a family, and uh, put our money where our mouths are. 
I'm wrapping my head around a sell-by date that's 70 years old, but I love, <laughs> I love that. Um, Mary, Mary, Mary Sue, what, what do you think about this? What do you want people to take away? Well, I, I would love people to take away uh, the, you know, grab the torch and help us fight for uh, the political will to support a healthier food system all the way around from farm to fork. And then um, I would also say to inspire you that cooking is a blast and it's a great, easy way to bond with your spouse or your family and a good way to take control of the impact of your food choices. Because if you're stuck just uh, depending on restaurants and, and you know, you don't know what choices they're making. And so I think you take control of, of <laughs> your own impact on the food system. Yeah, control that lettuce that's molding away in my refrigerator. <laughs> Karen, what do you want to take away from this? So very importantly, each one of us can make a contribution in a positive way by our own choices and our own behavior, whether it's saying I do want a smaller portion or making sure if I don't eat all of my restaurant meal, when I take it home, I'm actually going to eat it the next day. Leftovers are okay. And that I'm going to buy only what I'm going to cook this week. Like if we connect the dots of what the impact is of our decisions, that we each think very intentionally about the food we're purchasing, how we're going to prepare it, and we're avoiding the waste. That's number one. And two, let's invest and continue to support what Governor and First Partner have started with Farm to School, first rounds of grants. It's about from a very young age, learning about healthy eating and that it's fun, that gardening can be fun and preparing your own food can be fun. Like this is holistic approach to the child's mind, body, and their spirit of being able to be self-sufficient and understanding how they can grow to be their healthiest and best self ever. So lettuce, leaves can be snacks. I, I like that too. Michael, we're going <laughs> to give you the last word. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, my fellow panelists said it well um, with their comments, and um, so I had to come up with new new items um, as they kind of get <laughs> down their list. Uh, I, you know, I would say in Los Angeles and in California, I would like people to know that we are far ahead a lot of states and a lot of metro areas. So while we're highlighting, again, challenges, uh, that's how you get better. You set ambitious goals. That's how I think you know, goals are ultimately achieved. And uh, so I, that's one thing I would like people to know that we have a, a great entrepreneurial spirit here. We have a lot of can-do people. Uh, we, you know, a lot of people in the private sector and government that want to see change and are affecting change. So I think that's very positive. And I would just say also, this is uh, similar to what has been said earlier. This is definitely something everyone can do something about. This isn't some huge issue way over there. Oh my gosh, there's nothing I can do about this. You know, it, you know, gosh, a hundred billion pounds. How can I affect that? I think, you know, what we heard today, growing food locally, you know, all the different things we talked about in the last hour, you know, there, there are things that we all can do, ourselves included, we all can do to make a difference. This has been great. So I want everybody to now go to your refrigerators, pull out that um, bell pepper that's starting to look a little wrinkly and make a stew or something with it. And uh, I want to thank you all, all four of you, uh, for joining us tonight. And Clint, back to you. All right. What a great conversation. Thank you, Jeanette, and to our four panelists tonight. And everyone, let us turn up the beef. Those are three food puns there. So I hope, I hope that earned your respect. And let's all uh, address food waste. Allow me to thank our partners, starting with our presenting partner, City National Bank. This evening would not have been possible without you. Thank you, City National Bank. Please support our charity partner, Los Angeles Regional Food Bank. Take a moment to visit the link in the Zoom chat window to donate now at www.lafoodbank.org. Also, join us in celebrating the LA Times 2021 Gold Award and Restaurant of the Year Award winners at a special brunch and dinner event. These are taking place July 11th and 12th at 
don't even want to, I don't want to mispronounce these names, Fennekite and Gelagetza restaurants as part of Food Bowl. For tickets and more information on our upcoming Food Bowl events, please visit lafoodbowl.com. You don't want to miss those events, July 11th and 12th. I'm Clint Schaff with the Los Angeles Times. We're so glad you joined us, and we hope you had as much fun as we did. Thank you, and good night. Coming from Hawaii, we have a thing that we call ohana. Ohana is about family. And in Hawaii, we define family as everyone in your universe. And that's where City National Bank comes in. They truly understand our business. They take an interest to know where we're headed, and they understand the food industry. But they also understand our ohana, and no other bank does that.